Welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be back in Sofia, in my home country, Bulgaria. I'm excited to introduce my panel, and without further delays, the and next stars of the journey. And now for your panelists. The first panelist is Mr. Ethan Pierce, Director of Crypto Assets Institute. Your second panelist for this lecture is Mr. Mark Taverner, Global Ambassador for BitFury. Next up, Mr. Kohei Kurihara, the president of Tokyo Chapter at Government Blockchain Association and CMO at Collabogate. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I know it's the end of the day, of an exciting day, and we just have a little bit more of insight to tell you about how we believe, as experts in this panel, more of them than me, about how blockchain and how technology can have more impact into our social lives, in a positive way, of course. So at the Global Citizen Forum, our mission and my personal mission is about global citizenship and mobility. So we looked into how blockchain will change the way people overcome the only, I believe, biggest injustice in the world, the place that you're born. The only thing, or one of the main things that our, everybody in this room has is that nobody chooses the place of birth. And yet, that defines so much about where you can go and where you cannot go. We believe that nationalities and borders, as Stephen Hawker said, are not a reality of this world. When you look from the sky, there is no borders, there is no lines, and such should be our life. Blockchain could be one of these technologies that will change the way we'll cross borders will change identity, documents, medical, and so much more. So without further delays, I would like to ask <coughs> some of the panelists and experts here. Mark, tell us, what do you think, in your perspective, will be the next technology uh, breakthrough into social impact? Which sector, beside the cryptocurrency we have seen, use the most of it? What will be the next big thing? So at, at Bitfury, we're tremendously hopeful that the public sector is going to be something which will, or is going to be a sector which will embrace the opportunity of blockchain. I'll give you a couple of examples by that to, to illustrate what I mean. We've worked extensively with several governments around the world. Uh, the most notable project that we've worked on to date has been in the Republic of Georgia, where we've built a land registry service, which is live and has been live for the last two years across the whole country, with approximately 300,000 properties now registered on the blockchain. And why that's important and why I think this has such potential for positive impact is because now for the first time, a citizen in the Republic of Georgia can prove without doubt that they own what oftentimes is going to be their most valuable asset. And that's important to the citizen in the Republic of Georgia because even if there is a natural disaster that might destroy the public records, that might wipe out the paper-based records that might wipe out the databases that hold a, an attestation of the fact that they own that land, or if there is political turmoil and something happens and some bad men with guns come and force people away from their property, there is still an opportunity for that individual in any of those scenarios to prove to the international community that they are the rightful owner of what is going to probably be their most valuable asset. And when the situation returns to normal, which we always hope it does after a bad event, a natural disaster, or a political upheaval, that citizen can go back and demonstrate that that asset now should be repatriated to them because they can prove that they own it through referencing the blockchain. And that's just one example of where what we call registry services can rebuild the trust that citizens have lost a little in politics and somewhat of the trust that they might have lost in governments and in international organizations. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll pause at that point. <laughs> Thank you. Eden. Uh, yeah, I think um, a title insurance is definitely a, a, a very interesting one, and we're seeing that, that that's a great application that we can do right now. Um, you know, blockchain is this ability to replace 
um, historical trust authorities, uh, these intermediaries that we've developed, like you know the people who, uh, whether it's notaries or, or, or whoever are, are attesting to the fact that, that this piece of property um, is yours, uh, things like stock exchanges where you know, you've got an intermediary saying that this, this asset is transferring from this person to this person. I think blockchain really presents this opportunity to move from human, so fallible trust uh, authorities to what eventually will be you know, a 100% technologically based authority so you know whether it's fraud or just mistakes, you you know we see you know the potential for humans to 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 cause very expensive mistakes in the finance world and elsewhere, um, and we can potentially replace those intermediaries with the blockchain. So I think to look at a few other examples. Um, Definitely, if we look at e-voting, uh, we, we don't have confidence today uh, already potentially in the voting systems in a lot of places. We definitely should not have confidence in most e-voting systems because they've been all proven to be pretty, pretty weak or pretty, uh, there's, there's just issues there. If we can trust that the data is being recorded correctly, if that data is being recorded onto a, a blockchain, then, then it's immutable, meaning that it can't be modified by anybody at that point, and we start to get to a point where we can actually trust this data. Uh, we can see other things like, um, uh, there's a there's a French startup that I know that is could basically eventually be able to trace money from Christine Lagarde's signature at the IMF all the way to a villager in in, in some uh, third world uh, uh, situation where you know you can't re necessarily remove fraud, but now you'll be able to pinpoint exactly where the fraud is happening because the money has not gotten to where it needs to get to. Things like this that that make uh, uh, amazing advances in our ability to trust things. I think another one in terms of the our just daily lives, not really social impact, but in terms of impact socially. Uh, uh, in terms of our, our just our, our human existence, um, you know, we are confronted with the huge issue of fake news today in so much of our life, whether it's uh, politics or, or just in general not being able to trust where things are coming from. And, you know, we've seen these videos now where the video uh, is completely artificially intelligence generated where you have Obama or, or Trump or somebody saying something that they would not at all be saying, but you can't tell the difference because the technology is rapidly getting to a place like we just saw with this, this, this uh, the virtual reality uh, uh, piece just before. Um, very soon, it's going to be very hard to understand if, you know, to trust our eyes and our ears. So what if we were able to take the the verifiable, at the beginning, original content and push it to the blockchain and say that that is the right video of Obama speaking in the Oval Office um, or, or at a conference or whatever, and that, oh, the video you're looking at actually uh, doesn't validate in terms of the blockchain's record of this video, so it has been manipulated. Um, I think there's things like that that could be very interesting to kind of give us more trust in our systems and potentially replace some of these tr systems with trustable um, technology and not just humans. I totally agree, uh, Ethan. I just came from Hong Kong on a family uh, office UBS gathering where there was 150 of the wealthiest Chinese families talking about sustainable investment. And the main problem, all these wealthy families saying, we want to invest more into social impact funds and sustainable funds, but we don't trust the measurements. There is no credible institutions, and the UNDP is trying to take a role in certifying social impact and sustainable investments, but I think uh, it, the trust is even not there at, at the UN level. I think a technology that, as you said, can verify and trace the investment from the, the wealthy principle to really the impact and measured uh, in terms of science, in terms of uh, climate change, this is where the investor will feel much more impactful and will invest more. Yeah. Um, tell us about in Japan, uh, Kohia, how do you <coughs> How do you see this industry uh, growing and having an impact on the society? Uh, sure. To me, the, I personally believe the education is the one of the great impact with using blockchain technology because the, the kids and child's record has been uh, really important to figure out whether the progression is how it works. Because uh, I was uh, experienced with the nonprofit and educational sectors. They have uh, facing a lot of the very difficulty to overcome it by themselves. And educational record is not shared between the schools, uh, teachers, which has been uh, big barriers to overcome the student issues. Uh, I want to introduce one example. The, the Japanese company, the Sony, has been uh, working on this Mars right now. The Sony Education, they provide in the robotics education through the online, which is the class. Uh, the students can easy to take it in the class. 
so they try, try to put the blockchain technology in the futures because the educational, each of the kids' records could be installed uh, through the, the, the PC updates, which is uh, kind of the, the solution for the kids can easy to be shared uh, their own uh, progression between the, across the schools. Uh, once you uh, like go to the next grade, you have to be uh, submitted your own data to the teachers uh, because the teachers need to understand the, the, the status of the kids and students to provide them appropriately. So this type of the thing is happens in Japan and also the other example is in uh, South Africa. Uh, the one project has been uh, tried to uh, put the like social impact index. This project is uh, called the uh, IX Foundations. Um, they try to make their own the technology and the protocol. The, the one application has been uh, created, the code the name is uh, um, uh, Ampreed, which is a project to, to figure out the, the accuracy of the attendance of the school the kids. Um, so they track the record of the each uh, our education uh, is uh, working well now. Um, once the record could be uh, working so well, the social impact can be easily to track and how much of the impact they can credit. So this type of things that happens in the education sectors. The blockchain has been a new type of identification for the uh, schools, uh, kids, as well as the other um, the external people to come on board the education space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, from perspective of regulation, it's the big, I think, the next step of the industry. Um, how do you see geographically regulation uh, interfering into the growth of the sector? Is it stopping and slowing it? Is deregulation this is the answer? What do you see in Europe? So, yeah, so, so the Institute, the Crypto Assets Institute, we, we work with, with a lot of corporates and, and funds on tokenization and, and the blockchain economy, but specifically with governments on advising around adoption and regulation. And what I'm seeing across, across Europe, but also generally in, in, in most of the, the Western um, regulators that are looking at this, it looks like from the outside that a lot of them aren't, aren't doing anything or they're being slow, but the reality is they're taking the time to figure this out and to, to mm -hmm. do it well. So three weeks ago, um, at the Ministry of the Economy uh, in, in France uh, during Blockchain Week. It was the first event ever for crypto and blockchain in that building. Um, and it was to announce this new law uh, on economic development with a bunch of really cool uh, kind of crypto assets, uh, blockchain economy ideas baked in. No more capital gains on trading crypto. Um, no uh, VAT tax on raising crypto funds like an ICO and having to pay 20% on top of that. Um, no, uh, so doing things like basically only pay income tax when you take your, 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 your cash out of an exchange because you've made some money with it. Um, things like that, creating a digital asset service provider registry, meaning companies that deal in crypto and help people deal with crypto uh, in some way or deal with tokenized investments will have to be whitelisted um, to say that they, they do exist and that they have the best in practice solutions they need to put in place to manage these assets for people like any investment bank or, or, or large financial services company would, would, would normally need to do anyways. So that kind of stuff you wouldn't have expected from France uh, uh, necessarily historically around a subject like this. And all of a sudden, they go from being maybe not in the uh, uh, middle to top places to all of a sudden being a, a leader in Europe uh, in very f innovation friendly but regulatory um, correct uh, place. And so I think what we're seeing is Eventually, I believe that, that, that the technology, blockchain, as you know, we talk about these intermediaries, these trust authorities, can become the regulator. But in the meantime, humans need to be regulating these things. We saw lots of bad behavior in ICOs and other things, so we know that that happens. So we need regulators. Uh, I don't think regulation light is going to benefit anybody. If you're going to a jurisdiction that is making this easy on you to be regulatory compliant under securities laws, you're going to lose in the end, even if you're gaining in the short term because of that. Uh, I think that trustable businesses dealing in a global economy, whether, it, dealing, whether they're dealing with corporates or, or with, with governments or whatever, are going to want clear, uh, uh, transparent regulatory compliance. So I think we're seeing that it's all catching up. And it's all going to encourage, it's all, you know, Germany, I guess you were saying just today or, or, or yesterday published something, I haven't seen the, the, the details yet. This, maybe, maybe you have more on that. This is all snowballing, um, and we're getting there very quickly. So I think uh, regulation is, is, um, is catching up, which means the innovation will be able to start moving forward again at a faster pace now that they have the right to. 
Absolutely. You're right. I think Malta, Germany, France are all trying to step in into this area. Um, but uh, Mark, you're in London, so that's a different world. Uh, how it's on the other side of the border? <laughs> so uh, uh, the other side of the border. So London is still part uh, of the European Union, at least for a little while, and those of us that yeah. live there. Uh, I'm French, by the way, so I'm very passionate about Europe. We're hanging on to it with our fingernails. We don't want to give up. Did you get your passport? Of us. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, to, to my mind, London and the UK is dragging a little behind. And they had an opportunity to, to drive this maybe two years ago, and they kind of seized it with uh, a lot of what was going on in a part of London that we refer to as Level 39, which is down in Canary Wharf, so in the heart of the financial center where the team that founded that under the direction of the British government created what was Europe's largest fintech incubator. And it was out of that that the regulatory sandbox idea was born so that fintech innovators, not just blockchain companies, could play around in a safe environment, engage in a really constructive dialogue, not just with the, with the regulators, but also with government who issue the laws that the regulators then enforce. Uh, and you know, I think the UK, partly because of Brexit, has, has suffered and has fallen behind a little. But what's interesting is if you look at this globally, and I have the best job in the world because I travel all around the world talking to governments, talking to industries, coming to events such as this and listening to lots of people, um, you see a lot of opportunity for regulatory arbitrage amongst either honest players or you know, slightly dubious players in this space. Uh, and I'm not sure that's entirely helpful. So you do have some of the smaller, uh, some of the smaller nations. I won't mention names, who have been very early in enacting legislation to try and attract innovation, maybe to steal some strategic advantage, and to see if they could get some some interesting businesses to come and locate in their jurisdictions. But I think what that has caused, because it's not entirely heavyweight legislation, is a situation where you now have certain organizations in the blockchain world who are registered in a number of different jurisdictions, perhaps sometimes because what they're seeking is genuine guidance and genuine security to know that they're operating within the laws, but also sometimes because they're interested in cre creating perhaps a level of opaqueness that masks their operations, which is kind of strange because that's kind of the opposite of what blockchain should be about. It should be open, it should be transparent, and it should be there for everybody to look at. Uh, so I think globally the situation needs to catch up a little. We have France, we have Germany, who just issued a statement yesterday about their renewed drive to look at legislation and to see how they could turn Germany into a very attractive place for some of these blockchain and, and crypto-based businesses to come and operate. But also the European Commission. You know, there is an awfully large amount of discussion and work and thinking happening within the European Commission. I don't think there is a day that goes by without me seeing a really well thought through report coming out of the observatory. There is a blockchain observatory that has been running for nearly two years, I believe, within the European Commission. And there are a large number of really, really well constructed reports that are open for everybody to look at. There are also really interesting discussions with policymakers, with government, with industry bodies, talking about topics such as, beyond crypto, talking about topics such as, how do you get data portability? How do you set standards between different blockchains, given there probably isn't only going to be one blockchain that is adopted across an entire industry like supply chain, for example? So what do some of the standards need to look like? How do we treat things, big topics such as GDPR? How do you recognize an asset if an asset is a contract rather than a cryptocurrency? And how do you treat that under law? And what happens when you cross borders? between a country where there has been a well thought through piece of legislation into another country where the legislation has not yet been perhaps enacted. Uh, and what happens there? Because to your point about frictionless borders, blockchain and crypto has shown to us that this industry is global, it moves very quickly. But I think the fact that we don't yet have clear legislation is something which you know, could be a little risky to slow down the global adoption of some of these some of these really good use cases, particularly in complex um, industries like, say, supply chain, or even migrant workers. You know, you were talking earlier about the freedom of people to move around. We've been working on a really interesting project, uh, which I can't talk about the names of at the moment, but it, it's with a government and a very large, well-known brand to try and use blockchain to allow those workers who might want to sign up to a contract in one country 
to come and work in an entirely different country to help with the building of new plants and things such as that, i.e. infrastructure, but to have security, that their co security and the peace of mind that the contract they sign in their home country is maintained when they arrive in a new country and that they can prove that the terms of their contract is not only maintained and not been tampered with or changed, but are in keeping with the laws of the land in which they're now working and that are being maintained, i.e. the terms are being maintained, they're being paid what they should be paid, they're being given the benefits that they should be given as well. And those types of applications, firstly, can, I think, create massive opportunities for good. They can support this ability for us as global citizens to move around and make choices about where it is we would like to work, what it is we would like to do, but create almost mechanical, almost technology-based trust, whereas an individual who might be, I don't know, and I've done this myself, laboring, mixing cement to earn a living whilst you're a student, you can have the trust if your contract is baked into the blockchain and you can prove that your terms have been maintained, you can now have trust mechanically in a contract rather than needing to trust the individuals that you might have no personal relationship with when you might be three and a half thousand miles away from your hometown and in a, in a place where the laws are a little different and the yeah. currency is a little different and the language is a little different. So you can trust. seek that trust yeah. in the mechanical aspect of the blockchain to know that you're not being exploited. And I think that's wonderful for those people. It's a wonderful opportunity for people who want to move around the world. Absolutely. Now, trust, regulation, those are the key words. How in Asia do you uh, interpret that? In Japan, in South Korea, and Singapore, who are the leading hubs? Um, how do you see the governments and the regulation interfering? Yeah, I think the Asian market condition is very interesting because uh, we have uh, uh, very differences between the regional aspects. And Japan is been uh, for running to put the specific rule of the cryptocurrencies. We provided uh, the official license to organize a business running through the market, which is a very strict requirement to prove the, your business has been uh, like more healthy than any others. So that's the thing is with the common and Japanese market. Uh, besides the blockchain, Lord is been uh, struggling to find a solution from the government side. They have uh, some study session with the work in the private sectors. Uh, for example, like a copyrights, which is uh, kind of the Japanese strong point to export it, the Japanese contents to the other market, but the pilot is a very big uh, issues. Um, so they try to uh, like prevent it, the, the pirate's contents has been happens right in China. This is a very big loss. So they try to use the blockchain technology to prove this is the Japanese contents. This is the one thing that happens. Um, the other market, like in South Korea, is, uh, I was visited the last time is in uh, this January, I had uh, talked with the government. They had uh, started the pilot program uh, through the um, 2018 and 90s. In total, it's the 80s project in uh, several sectors. They tried to organize it. They also like a big company, the Samsung LZ, uh, uh, like um, the Chinese big behemoth has been started to use the blockchain technology and also they try to credit their own the business, which is in a very big impact uh, the South Korean market right now. The China has been uh, uh, like um, the against of the crypto market. They had uh, prohibited to uh, do the business regarding the crypto. Since then, the, some of the Chinese business has been a uh, uh, excluded to the outside the market, then some of them is go to the South Korea, is go to the others is to the Singapore or somewhere. But the Chinese government has been uh, uh, pay attention with the blockchain technology itself, um, not only for the like national government, but also the local government has been uh, very proactive to invest in the local development. Like uh, Hanjong is the one of the the like uh, biggest cities. The Alibaba, the headquarters is there. They have uh, invested uh, uh, beyond the dollars to the, the blockchain uh, for strain, which is uh, kind of the very big trend. So even though we talked about the Asian market, we have a very different conditions, right? And in Singapore is to try to focus on the FinTech technology related to the blockchain. They also that the country is a Thailand to become a, a SAR, um, like exchange centers uh, behind uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. This is the kind of the strategy of the government level. So the Asian market has been growing so far, but 
in the blockchain space, we have a very different um, background, a different identities uh, to, to grow up uh, with the entire economy right now. Thank you. Now, I would like to ask you a summary in terms of two biggest opportunities and two biggest threats of blockchain industry. Uh, opportunities and threats. Um, well, I think uh, to start on the, on the threat side, I think you know, we, we do, some of this technology does have to s get to a point where it can scale well. I think a lot of the public blockchain projects are, you know, that's their, one of their big issues right now. So we, we see a lot of promise, but the technology has to catch up. I don't see that really as a real threat, but it is the, it is the negative right now that I think we would have. I do think um, for a lot of the solutions that, that I could maybe talk about as opportunities, then people will have to, I think, uh, the unknown is how much will the market um, really adopt or, or accept the, the new ways to look at these things. If we talk about trust authorities and replacing some of these historical intermediaries, you know, is our markets open to that? Will people actually trust technology more than they trust humans, even though we can, just if we can very clearly show how the humans make plenty of mistakes or plenty of fraud you know, along the way? So, uh, yeah, but, but do those things actually change? In terms of real opportunities, I think there's all kinds of stuff. We mentioned all these other great examples of, of, of how we can change these systems and, and, and change the, 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 I don't know if it's, you know, not, not well-being, but in the sense of our, our confidence and our, willing, our ability to be comfortable with how these things work. Um, uh, I think in, in the great opportunity for me really is in tokenized securities moving forward. So. Uh, tokenized securities is this idea of security tokens. It just simply means you know, investments that are regulated by, by the, the specific government regulator. And this is going to democratize access into things like, like small and medium businesses oh, um, and uh, real estate and intellectual property and all kinds of stuff. But I think that might be our, our last of our, our thing. I think we have a couple of minutes more. Okay, well, there <laughs> we go. So please. So I, I think uh, a couple of the biggest opportunities. What One is continuing to draw on the fact that a lot of blockchains are open source. Uh, and what that means is that it's the, the technology, the software, the knowledge is open to be discovered by any entrepreneur, any government, any organization that wants to exploit and build on top of it. And there was a great example just today I saw, or maybe yesterday coming out in the press, about Microsoft. Microsoft are building on top of the Bitcoin blockchain an identity-based solution. And why are they building there? Because it's open source. And in this Microsoft statement, they said something along the lines that open source was the only direction in which you could travel to build in this way using this technology. So I think that's a big, big, it's a different way of thinking, and I think that's a big opportunity. I think the second big opportunity would be to look, and I come back to public services again, uh, or the public sector, is for governments to reimagine the way in which they govern whether that be through better governance, using things like the blockchain, more transparent governance, which can be mechanically checked, or whether it's ways of delivering service like registries or ID or voting. Uh, and that for me is super exciting, because back to the topic of making a difference to people's lives, that would make an enormous difference if trust was reestablished and the mm. cost of delivering services was greatly reduced. A couple, a, a couple <laughs> of threats, uh, just to finish up. Um, in fact, I think I'll, I'll finish up with three, and it's a lack of. A lack of, number one, education, number two, a lack of education, and number three, a lack of education. <laughs> well said. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that this is the opportunity and the challenge, and that we have to make a, a new standard of a data sharing ecosystem so that we need to make a collaboration regardless of your background, the gender, or something like that. Um, we've been working on some, some consulting advisory for the enterprises. They uh, just want to remain their own system. But the society has been changing more flexible and more collaborative to do the achieve the something that they want. I guess the blockchain has been a great opportunity to make a conversation uh, between the people that come on board. Uh, I'm coming from Asia, but I guess the, the Asian and Europe has been uh, like the very big opportunity to collaborate with something new. The way like from China and America is also be uh, impressive. So th this type of the thing is needed. Um, what we can do make sure that there's something, the goodness for the society. So the blockchain will tell me about it, about the many things. That's, that's uh, things uh, I, I believe that it's uh, needed for us to do the something like this. 
Thank you. And I agree with my colleagues. I think um, the, one of the opportunity we see it is uh, we have seen in the refugee camps right now there is 50 million people without passports, without identity. Imagine opening a bank account. Imagine living a life without an identity document. And I think the blockchain is the only answer right now. And in 2050, 10% of the global population will have to relocate. Will be by then 10 billion. That will be 1 billion on the move. Not everybody will have time, or no, everybody will have passwords. So if we don't have the technical, techni technology solution today, how our children will be dealing with that mobility of a billion people just in the space of one generation? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and please enjoy the rest Thank of the you. evening.